I want you to grab that outline that we gave you when, when you came in. And, and today I'm going to speak to you on the subject, get him close. Get him close. Say, come close, God. We're going to talk about getting God close to you. And I, I want to read from 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 2. And then we're going to read Psalm chapter 24 all together. You're going to read it with me. This is talking about David. Then he addressed the entire assembly of Israel as follows. If you approve, and if it is the will of the Lord our God, let us send messages to all the Israelites throughout the land. And it's estimated there were over 2 million uh, Israelites that he's talking about that, that would have gotten this message. Including the priests and the Levites in their towns and pasture lands, let us invite them to come and join us. And, and look at what I've underlined here. It is time to bring back the ark of our God. It is time to bring back the ark of our God, for we neglected it during the reign of Saul. And then Psalm chapter 24, and before we read this, I'll just tell you, uh, David wrote many of the Psalms, but historians and theologians believe that he wrote this particular Psalm uh, as he was bringing the ark of God into Jerusalem. And so kind of the background to this Psalm is when he, he has the ark and they're bringing it for the first time into Jerusalem. So let's all read this together. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with God, their Savior. Such people may seek you and worship in your presence, O God of Jacob. Open up ancient gates. Open up ancient doors and let the King of glory enter. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord invincible in battle. What a great psalm. And, you know, this is what's cool about it is this was his inauguration. And so he was the king. But instead of him saying, I'm the king of glory, he said, who's the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. And, and although he was king and everybody was acknowledging he was king, he was acknowledging a greater king. He was leveraging his earthly position to bring in the true heavenly king. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would just... Speak to us in these next few moments, Lord. Uh, change our lives. Oh, Holy Spirit, I ask you to change my life. Work on me. I pray you would change the hearts of every person that's here. Lord, uh, our time is valuable, but Lord, we, we've come to kneel at your feet and to hear from your word today. So speak to us, Lord. At every campus, I welcome your presence to come in and have your way at Baker Campus, Mid-City, at the Warehouse, at Livingston Parish. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Come on, give somebody a high five and you guys can be seated. I got so pumped up about yesterday that I, I just had to sport my serve 225 one more day. I see, I see a few people wearing theirs. And you know, if, if they're wearing theirs, that means that they were probably doing a non-sweat serving. <laughs> Which is cool. But some of you messed your t-shirt up so bad, you wouldn't dare wear it to church today. So... Uh, yesterday was absolutely incredible, and again, I just want to reiterate how proud I am of our church. If you ever want to just be blessed, go on our social media page, click on the hashtag Serve225, and you'll see thousands of pictures of this army of believers out there serving people. We had so many people give their hearts to the Lord yesterday. It was awesome. People making decisions for Christ, and thousands of believers from all these churches were connected, and just what a joyous day. It was absolutely incredible. Uh, before I preach to you this morning, I'd like to share a personal testimony uh, with you guys. You know, last year, my wife and I were expecting our fourth child, and uh, at 31 weeks, she had a stillborn, and it was one of the saddest times in our life, and, and I've just been open with you guys about it. It was, it was really tough for us, uh, but I'm so proud to say today that uh, we're announcing that we're expecting again, and um, so God is good to us, amen? She's, she's 13 weeks yesterday, so she's passed through that first trimester, and uh, this baby is due in January of 2018, so... Y'all pray for us, you know. It's, a, it's our rainbow baby, and we're still wondering: are we, are we, do we, are we sane? Like, you know. But uh, we're excited about it. So, I want to talk to you about getting God close to you, getting God close to you. 
There's nothing more important than having God right up close to you. And David watched Saul, his predecessor, he watched him rule for 40 years. And David wasn't alive the entire time he was ruling, but David got to see it up close. And you know what he saw in Saul? He saw a man who did not care about God's presence in his life. Saul led without consulting God. As a matter of fact, he consulted witches, mediums. He had all these other places that he went for wisdom, but he just did not care about the presence of God. And in those days, you know, right now, God's presence is all around us. It's in us. But uh, God's presence was best reflected in the Ark of the Covenant, where God, his presence rested on the Ark of the Covenant. And that the Ark of the Covenant was at a guy named Abinadab's house. Lucky Abinadab, you know, it's off in the mountains. Abinadab has the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of God. And Saul could care less about God's presence And David saw that. David saw Saul go mad because he tried to lead without the presence of God. And I want to just tell you, if you try to make it through your life, through your marriage, through your family, through your career, through your education, without the presence of God, you'll go crazy. You got to have the presence of God up close to you. And so David finally gets inaugurated as the king of Israel. And the Bible says that God called David out of the sheep fields. David was a nobody, but David was humble enough to realize if I'm going to take over this kingdom, I'm a shepherd. I better have God close to me. And, 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 you know, when anybody gets elected into a big public office, they are evaluated in the first 100 days and they, everybody scrutinizes what decisions do they make first and what, what laws do they pass? What decisions do they make first? And that really will show that forecast what their leadership is going to look like. So what did David do in his first 100 days? The very first thing David did as king of all Israel was to say, i got to get the ark of God's presence into Jerusalem. And for three months, he had to work on this project. He called all of Israel together and said, we're going to get the presence of God in in our lives. And I just want to make this real practical to you guys. I just want to let you know in your life, Having God's presence around and in and with you is going to make life a lot easier than if you try to do it on your own. And you can be a believer, but not be acknowledging God's presence in nearness and not experience the fruit of it. We are to cultivate his presence, host his presence. And David went all out his first 100 days to get God's presence. So let me give you four points in this story of getting God's presence close to you. The first thing is God's presence must be a priority. It must be a priority. Aren't you glad to have your outlines back? Somebody told me, I appreciate these guest speakers, but I just want some blanks to fill in. (laughs) God's presence must be a priority. Angie and I, when we travel, we both pack entirely different. And I don't know if you guys are like that when you travel somewhere. You know, I'm packing everything that's fun. I'm going to pack iPhone cables, iPads, uh, game consoles, and I'll forget underwear and toothbrush and, and, and the things that you should bring. And I'll bring everything that's fun, all the games. And, and then you go see Angie's bag. She has no iPhone chargers. Most women don't care about their chargers, just so you guys know, right? All the men say Amen. You know, your wives don't care at all about a charger until they're on zero, and then they want to charge their phone on your charger. Is that, nobody else can relate to that? Maybe that's just my, my marriage, you know. But I'm always bringing the chargers. But Angie's the way more responsible one. She's got diapers. She's got food and snacks for the kids. She's got, she's got all this stuff. She's got my toothbrush and her toothbrush, and she really prioritizes better than me. And I just want you to know some of us prioritize better than others. What are you pursuing as first in your life? I'm telling you, many of us got our bags packed out with entertainment, but we really need the essentials of God's presence. I can tell you this. If you pursue God's presence more than anything in your life, you would be a very happy, satisfied, joyful person. Your life would be so awesome. But yet we go after all these things, and and David said, I must 
have God's presence in my life. I want you to see this psalm about how David was so passionate about God's presence. Lord, remember David and all that he suffered. He made a solemn promise to the Lord. He vowed to the mighty one of Israel, I will not go home. I will not let myself rest. I will not give sleep to my eyes or close my eyelids in slumber until I find a place to build a house for the Lord, a sanctuary for the mighty one of Israel. Say priority. Say priority. Say early morning. Say first thing. This is the first thing in your rulership is I got to have God's presence in my life. Can I just challenge believers that are here that maybe you're not prioritizing God's presence in your life. Make it a priority. Say the first thing I got to have in my life is his presence. David was smart. He knew that he needed God's presence in his leadership. What would it be like if the political leaders of our time were to put God's presence in their life as the foremost priority? That would be awesome. See some smart decisions being made, right? But what if you prioritized your, the presence of God and, and what would it, how would it affect your leadership? The second thing, he needed God, uh, God's presence for the unity of God's people, for the unity of God's people. You know, he pulled millions of people together. There's only one thing that will bring millions of people together, and that's the presence of God. You know, I, I want to just give God the praise for this. Bethany is 50, uh, 54 years old, going on 55 years old. And in 54 years of ministry, we've never had a church split. And maybe, you, maybe you've maybe you never been a part of churches in the past. That's unheard of. Churches are like, I don't like where the door is at. I don't like where the coffee's at. I don't like the seats. I don't like, the, we're going to start a new, new, new church. And, and they're always splitting. I'm telling you, when God's presence is somewhere, there is unity. And God commands the blessing on unity. That's why as a church, the presence of God should be something we corporately seek together. Man, we should come into this place as we gather and say, we need God's presence in this place. But David realized that he needed God's presence in order to unify the people. And then he, this is the most important thing. He needed God's presence for his own satisfaction. Psalm chapter 16, verse 11 says, You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. What a powerful statement. Fullness of joy. Say fullness. That means no discouragement, no depression, no anxiety. In his presence is the fullness of joy. And I don't know what heaviness is on you right now, what anxiety is on you right now, but the answer is the presence of God. I I was speaking to a friend of mine who's really walking through a a, a hard time in his life, a really hard time. And it was one of those that, man, I needed to pray about because it was a hard, hard thing. And he was saying, what do I need to do? And I said, I'm going to have to pray about your situation, but I can tell you what you need to do first. And you probably haven't done it in a while. You need to go get some worship music and turn it on, and you need to begin to cultivate and, and, and host the presence of God. And you're going to feel a spiritual renewal because many of us run on empty, empty You're saved, but you're on E. You don't have any, you just feel dry. And I'm telling you, the key to that is the presence of God. Put that scripture back up. Psalm 130, in your presence is the fullness of joy. Some people say, man, pastor, I just got to have 30 minutes with you. I got to have wisdom. There's a good chance I'd tell you exactly what I told that guy. I don't know the answer, but you need to get in God's presence because in his presence is the fullness of joy. Say priority. It's got to be a priority in your life. Then the the second thing that we see in this story is God's presence must be honored. Honored. It means esteemed. Theology is what we believe about God. And your theology is important because you could be believing the wrong thing about God. A lot of people are confused. You know, God is loving. But some people think that God's like the Santa Claus in the sky And he's just my buddy. God's my pal. He's my dude. Uh, He's creator. Like he just thought about you and spoke it and you came into existence. He saw some dirt and formed it and breathed life into it and magic happened. He is incredible. He's holy. That's what it means. He's uncommon. And God will refuses to be treated as common and ordinary. He does love us. He does want to be close to us. But there must be that honor. I remember years ago, my, my girls, my, I love my girls. My girls, we, we're, we're so close. But one day, 
my girl started calling me Johnny. <laughs> hey, Johnny. I, said, I told Angie, I don't know how I feel about that. I'm not Johnny. I'm daddy. <laughs> so I said, you don't call me Johnny. You call me dad. I, I'm, nobody else on the planet gets to call me dad but you, but you have to call me dad. I'm not Johnny to you. In the same way, God must be honored in our lives by the way we live, by the way we treat him, in our, in our perspectives. And David, all, he loved God, but he didn't honor God. He, that ark, he said, let's build a new cart. And so he fashioned this cart, and he sent it off to Abinadab's house, and they put the ark of the covenant on, uh, on the cart. And the Bible says that the oxen began to pull it, and David started having a party. Now, I want you to imagine this. You have millions of people, and they're all celebrating, and here comes the ark, and they're like, wow, there's the ark. They hadn't seen it in decades. And this represents, this is like the icon of their whole culture and their whole civilization on this cart. They're in awe of this thing. But here's the problem. God had commanded them, when you carry my ark, don't put it on a cart. It must be carried on the shoulders of priests. David didn't do it God's way. He had a better idea, a creative idea, a new idea of how to bring God's presence in. And so God was on edge. God was going with it, but he was on edge. He was like, I don't like this. I don't like how y'all are treating me as common and, or, and, and ordinary. Well, Uzzah was walking behind the cart, and the cart hit a pothole, and the whole wagon tilted and the ark started to fall off, you would think that God would appreciate that Uzzah would stick his hand up and stabilize the ark. Because the ark, if it fell out, man, the Ten Commandments were in there. They could have burst it on the floor. I mean, you would have thought God would appreciate it. Uzzah reached his hand up and touched the ark to put it back in its place, and God struck him dead. Boom. Music stopped. <laughs> Two million people celebrating, and the party came to a screeching stop. I want you to know something about God. God is not scared. He's not afraid to stop the party. He is not afraid to stop the party. He doesn't think like we think. We think, God, two million people celebrating your presence, your ark. You know, come on. You know, tell that to Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. Everybody's all excited about their giving and selling property and the church's their revival. And all of a sudden, they're dragging Ananias and Sapphira out dead. And, and all of a sudden, this church was scared to death. God is not afraid to stop the party if it's not going how he prescribed it to go. This applies so many areas of your life. But I just want to tell you, if you want the presence of God in your life, you have to treat it with honor. You have to treat it with respect. And, and this is, comes just through the way we live. Ephesians chapter 4. Do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. What that means is don't be somebody that says, oh, God, I want you near. I want you close, and I celebrate your presence. I love your presence. And then, then live immoral. You grieve the Spirit of God. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, but it just means you need to honor his presence. I'm going to tie this in to our New Testament readings because we're reading through Romans, and I can't go through Romans without giving you some sort of revelation. Today we were in Romans chapter 3, one of the cornerstone chapters of the Bible. And let me just tell you what this represents. The cart that's coming in represents the works of man. You can't bring God into your life by your good works. This was the very best that they could invent, and they had oxen always represents work. And he had him behind these oxen. And God says, no, my presence comes in on the shoulder of the priest, which represents Jesus Christ. You can't get to God by just being good. You have to come through Jesus. God said, don't bring me on a cart. I must come through the priest. And in, I want to read a passage in Romans. And uh, this is a lengthy passage, but look how powerful this is. Say, priest, priest. not a cart. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Keep going. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Elbow somebody and say, you fall short. Did you know that? The guy up here falls short. Bad. I fall short. I just do. 
Everyone has sinned. We all fall short, yet God freely and graciously declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. Not a cart, but a priest. Well, that's good enough right there. That's good. So we have to honor God's presence. And then the third thing is that God's presence must be celebrated. David did his homework, and he realized what had happened. Now, imagine this is David's first 100 days. He calls all the people together. God kills a man. The party is dispersed. This is not a good first 100 days. If Fox News and CNN were covering this, it would be bad. (laughs) David's first 100 days in office, people are killed. Arcs are dropped. Carts are destroyed. You know, it's going bad. But he says, I I, I must have God's presence. What must I do to get God's presence? So he does his homework and realizes it must come on the shoulder of priests. And so he gets some priests. He purifies their lives. And then 2 Samuel, let's read the the account of what happened. Then King David was told, the Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's house and everything he has because of the ark of God. Because after the ark had fallen or had stumbled, David took the ark and put it in the home of Obed-Edom and just said, I don't know what to do with it, so I'm going to keep it here for a little while. But then Obed-Edom's house started to be blessed. See, God's presence can bring a blessing or a cursing on your life. For Uzzah, it was bad. For Obed-Edom, it was great. just depends on your life. But So David goes. So David went there and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with a great celebration. After the men who were carrying the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, David sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. Say all. All. That doesn't mean like a little dance. That means like crazy dance. I can't even do what he probably did. Wearing a priestly garment. So David and all the people of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts of joy and the blowing of ram's horns. But as the ark of the Lord entered the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked down from her window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she was filled with contempt for him. There's two ways to respond to the presence of the Lord. You can, like David, celebrate it with joy and excitement. Or like Michael, you can look on. Both of them are watching the same thing. God's presence is coming into our life, into our city. And there's two ways to respond. You can respond with a sour, reserved, I don't worship like that. Or like David, you can get more and more and more excited. So let's let's kind of picture this. Obed-Edom's house, anywhere between 5 and 20 miles away from Jerusalem. And that's a long hike that these priests had to make. They put the ark on their shoulders. Can you imagine how scared these guys are? Last time somebody touched it, they died. So these guys, they walk towards it, and they put it on their shoulder, and they walk six steps. One, two, three, four, five, six. And and then they set it down. David said, everybody all right? Everybody good? Let's party! So six steps. He just wanted to check and make sure everything was all right. And he said, let's start killing some stuff. Bring, bring a, 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 a heifer, a cow. And, and they started sacrificing to the Lord because he had brought them that far. Say praise as you go. <laughs> if you want to cultivate the presence of God in your life, you got to praise as you go. Six steps. Stop sacrifice, give praise. Somebody say six days. days. And then on the seventh, I'm in God's house. I'm going to stop. I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to praise. Come on. Six steps, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and on Sunday, put it down and let's have a party. Let's celebrate what God has done. And he said, everybody okay? All right, let's go another six steps. They went another six steps, put it down, killed some more animals, sacrificed to God, danced. And and, and this thing, they didn't grow weary in their energy. Their energy started to get higher and higher as they got closer and closer to the city of Jerusalem. Which shows you, when you serve the Lord and you're in his presence, you get more and more energized throughout your life, not more and more tired. If you do this thing right, you're going to cultivate the presence of God. 
I'm glad they left this here for me. I haven't forgotten everything. I'm sure David, when they started out, everybody was scared, and he was kind of, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, again I say, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, again I say, Rejoice. And they set it down, and they started to to sacrifice, and then he picked it up a, a little bit more. He said, Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Because you are good all the time, all the time. You are good. You are good. Yeah. All the time. You are. And they set it down. And they sacrificed, and then he said, we worship you, hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you for who you are. Set it down and shout, you are good. Yeah, yeah, you can stop though, you can stop. And that thing kept growing and growing and growing. Their praise got louder and louder. And this thing, I'm telling you, if you start living a life of worship, it grows and grows. They got louder and louder. And so by the time they got to Jerusalem, David was just jumping and screaming. And I'm talking about a king. There's only one thing that will make a king do that. It's a greater king. You're not going to. You're not going to get a king to lose his dignity unless there's a greater king that he's the servant of. So David just danced like a wild man. Guys, it says some of his clothes started falling off, like his his outer coat started falling off. I mean, he's going bananas. The king of all of Israel is going like this. And Michael, his wife, looks on and it's just critical, Just, just critical. She didn't get it. And Partly because she watched her dad her whole life, King Saul, never worship. Although he never lost his dignity, he did lose his kingdom. David lost his dignity but got a kingdom. And so afterwards, when David walked into the house, I bet he was probably looking for some encouragement from his wife. Baby, we got the ark. We got it. And and she said... David, you look so stupid out there. You look, and and you can imagine that that didn't go so well. And they started to fight. And they had a a fight right up in in the palace. And as David was walking out, she said, she said, you made a fool of yourself today in the presence of all of Israel. And David ripped around and he said, I will yet be more undignified than this woman. And he probably danced on the way out. Like, can I, can I, I want to just talk to you about your expression of worship. Bethany does it a little bit different. And maybe you've noticed that if you start coming to church here that we lift our hands, we sing, we do all these things. And if you come up and, um, different type of backgrounds. It's real reserved or real solemn. You know, I believe that the Bible teaches us, if all you got to do is read the Psalms, it's like our blueprint of worship. It says, clap your hands, all you people. I don't know what that means other than clap your hands, all you people. It says, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. That means like you won something. Like, come on, when your sports team wins something, you lose your mind. Come on! You go in bananas. That's kind of what this means is shouting to God with a voice of triumph. Dance before the Lord with all of your heart. You know, all of these expressions of worship are totally biblical, and David modeled this. You know, as I study to preach, oftentimes I'll uh, read different commentaries from different great theologians and authors. What's ironic to me is although they have great insight into the scriptures, 
Every one of them, when you come to passages like David or passages like singing to the Lord a new song, shouting to God with a voice of triumph, clap your hands, all you people, all the things that we do, they say, now this doesn't mean that today we should copy that same type of worship. If the Bible ain't good for that, I don't know what it's good for. This is how, and man, God's presence in your life should impact the way that you worship. And I'm just going to tell you, there's something about audibly singing the praises of God. There's something powerful about it. You want me to show it to you in the scriptures? Acts chapter 17, when, when Paul and Silas were in the bottom of, a, of, of the prison, and they were down there, they were in stocks, and they just started to sing hymns unto God, and all of a sudden, the whole prison began to fall apart, and their stocks broke off. What if they had kept their mouth quiet? They would, they would have died in that jail. There's something powerful about you expressing your praise to God. Be more like David and less like Michael. More like David and less like Michael. Celebrate the presence of God. Boy, I could preach on this all day. You know, I'm, I'm a worship leader, so I, I got lots in my... But I want to encourage you to be a people who's not scared to demonstrate... Your praises of God. So why do we have 25 minutes of song service when we all gather? Is that just to have some time for everybody to get here so we can have the teaching of God's word? No. And it's not here for your entertainment. You can watch America's Got Talent and be entertained. You don't need this for your entertainment. This is here to serve you so we can express to God our gratitude for how good he is. We're not up here singing because we need another show. We don't need another show. We need an opportunity to corporately express to God how grateful we are. And we don't do that like this. We so good. Thank you, God. I appreciate it. You're just good. You sucker. At a, at a Tigers game, you're going crazy. How dare you give God less than what you give some sports team or something come on man this thing ought to impact your expression it ought to impact your expression you don't know where to start just lift a hand up like this <laughs> kind of clap a little bit you know i'll tell you i remember when god set me free i remember the day I got set free from the fear of man and realized that my life was to give God glory. He gave me this body to give him glory. And I began to express. I lift my hands as a symbol of faith that I believe in an unseen God. I lift it to him who dwells in the heavenlies as a sign of surrender. When I sing a, a song unto him, it's because I'm doing it to please him. Let this song be a, ple a pleasing sound to your, to your ear, God. I dance because I want to express the joy I have that he redeemed my soul from death and sin. I don't know about you, but he forgave me from a lot of stuff. He forgives me every day. He's going to forgive the stuff I do in my future. I've got a lot to celebrate about. Now, when you see me, it may be a little bit vanilla. I'm white as white can be. And so when I dance, it's going to be up and down. You know, I just, that's all I got right here. I just keep it right here. Some of y'all got a little flow, you know. You, I look over and you rocking. It's all good. It's all good. When you, when you get to heaven, it's going to be all flavors, varieties, all kinds. And I'm telling you, whoo. have you ever seen churches in Africa celebrate? We need a dose of that. I've been there to those churches. There's no inhibitions, just celebrating God. Churches all over the world and in India and in Brazil just partying. And a lot of times we just come in church. I tell you, not me, not me. You know, and, and I say, as for me and my house, we, we're going to worship God. This house will be a house of worship. Never feel worried about expressing your praise to God. And then the, the last thing I'll give you real quick is God's presence must be hosted. You can't just set it anywhere. David prepared a tent. He built a place that it was going to abide. 
And you have to determine in your life, this is not just a one-day thing. I'm going to do it the rest of my life. I'm going to worship the Lord for the rest of my life. Two passages, and this is from our readings. They brought the ark of God and placed it inside the special tent David had prepared for it. And they presented burnt offerings and, and peace offerings to God. David arranged for Asaph and his fellow Levites to serve regularly before the ark of the Lord's covenant, doing whatever needed to be done each day. Each day, they hosted the presence of God. And uh, can I give you a challenge this week for seven days? Say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Here's your challenge. Here's your challenge. If you choose to accept it, I challenge you to get a hold of a great worship CD or if you use Spotify or iTunes, whatever you use, get a hold of a great worship CD. And this entire week, cultivate the presence of God in your home and in your car and everywhere you are. Let's have a week where we just kind of turn off the talk radio and the, and the negative news. It's going to be just as negative this week as it was last week. I promise you. They're going to have, they're going to have lots of negative stuff to say. Just turn it off for a week, and let's cultivate God's presence in our homes and in our cars and everywhere we go. Let's just do it. I'm going to do it myself. And I, let's see if God's presence makes the difference in our attitudes, in our satisfactions, in our unity, in our joy, in our families. I promise you, get the ark up close. Get him close. And it's going to change some things in your life. Don't live a dry Christianity. Get the ark up close. Amen? Amen. Man. So I would be remiss to not give us an opportunity to worship God after that message, right? I know you're like ready, ready to, to, to give, it a, give it a go, to worship God, and we're going to do that in a moment. But before we do it, I'd like you all just take a moment and bow your heads, please. Just put your outlines down and bow your heads and listen to, the, listen to my voice. Listen to the words that I'm saying. If you're here and you feel distant from God because you're not in a right relationship with him, you know that you're not in a right relationship with him. Guys, that's what sin does to us. Sin pushes us away from God, and that's the natural byproduct of being human. You just are away from God, but there is a way to know God, and it's through Jesus Christ. All you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ, put your faith in him, repent of your sins, Ask him to come into your life and forgive you, and he will do it. Every person here that is a believer is, is proof of that, that he comes in our lives, and he forgives us, and he washes us. And to the, today, if you say, Pastor, I don't know that I'm right with the Lord. I feel very far from God, but I would love for my sins to be forgiven. I would love to, to have God near me, to have God close to me. I want to be born again. I want to put my faith in Jesus Christ, and, and, and I want to be a Christian. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. Christ. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed at every single campus, but this is your moment. You may never have another moment and something that, that is said so clear to you about how to receive God. And so I'd like to ask you to respond. If, if God's dealing with your heart and you'd like to give him your heart, when I count to three, I'd like you just to lift up your hand and wave it at me at all of our campuses. Our campus pastors are, are there. They'll see your hand if you're at another campus. But here at South Campus and in each campus, if God's dealing with you, I, I'd like to pray with you. I'd like to lead you. It's a privilege to me. This is one of the greatest privileges of my life is to lead you uh, to, to, to a relationship with God. One, two, three. Come on, just lift it up. If that's you and you say, I need God. Okay, all right, sir. Awesome. Lift it up high. Wave it at me so I can see you. If you need God, okay, all the way in the back. God bless you. God bless you back there. Okay, all right, all right, okay. God bless you. Lift it up. All right, okay, all right. Lift it high at each campus. This is a statement of faith. You're saying, I need you, God, in my life. All right, ma'am. That's awesome. Okay, God bless you there. Lift it high. Lift it high, and then you can slip your hands down. Man, there's so many people that are giving their hearts to Jesus. Come on, church, let's pray this prayer with them all out, out loud, audibly. Say this, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. You are the true king. I put my faith in you for the forgiveness of my sins. Come into my life, Jesus. I accept you into my heart. I want to be born again, not of the flesh, but of the spirit on the inside, creating me a clean heart. Wash away my sin. 
my shame, my guilt, and make me righteous with God. I believe in you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate with those who just gave their hearts to the Lord.